Joshua 14, and we're going to begin reading in verse 5. It says, The Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore to me on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trod shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you wholly followed the Lord God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am today, 85 years old, yet I am as strong today as on the day Moses sent me out. Just as my strength was then, so it is now for war and for going in and for coming out. Therefore, give me that mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and the cities were large and fortified. But maybe the Lord will help me and I shall drive them out as he said. Then Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron the son of, uh, to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance because he wholly followed the Lord God. Then the land had rest from war. I wonder if you just turn over real quick to chapter 15, and I want to just read a little P.S. to the story of Caleb and taking his mountain. Joshua 15, and if you look just quickly in verse 14, let's read how the story played out. Joshua 15 and verse 14, Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shishai, Ahiman, and Telmai, the sons of Anak. Then he went up from there to Debir, and Caleb said, he who attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it to him, I will give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. And if we read to the end, we find out for a wedding present, Caleb gave them land, and he gave them springs of water. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us today. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your word. Your word is truth. I pray that we would encounter you today, Father. As we share the words of God, if your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen. Since Easter, we've been sharing the letter to the Galatians together, and Pastor Nick is about to bring that letter to a spectacular conclusion. But today, I want to veer away from the book of Galatians, and I want to just share some things from my heart with you. On Tuesday, Denise and I are headed to the School of Acts in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, We'll be ministering in Pastor Raymond's two churches there in Kuala Lumpur. We'll be teaching in the school all week. And then Pastor Raymond asked me if I would stay on another week and go to Indonesia and teach at the School of Acts there. Although uh, the Kuala Lumpur is the home campus, there's actually a bigger student body in Indonesia, and we'll be ministering in a number of churches over those two weekends. So we're going to be gone. We'll pray for you while we're gone. I hope you'll pray for us while we're gone. And when we return, it'll be time to hold a special business meeting with our members to discuss the finances for phase two. We have scheduled that meeting for Wednesday evening, September 3rd. And then we have scheduled our groundbreaking for phase two for Sunday morning, September 14th. So I wanted to take a few minutes today and I wanted to talk to you from my heart about claiming your mountain. A little while ago, we traveled to Phoenix, Arizona to visit our friend Tommy Barnett. When we flew into Phoenix, we were struck by the rocky mountain peaks that jut up all over the desert in the Phoenix area. From the air, it looks like somebody just took a bag of rocks and scattered them all over the desert floor. But one of those mountain peaks crops up right behind Tommy Barnett's church, and we decided to climb it one afternoon. And when we started climbing, it didn't seem like just a little rock pile anymore. 
we discovered that it was a lot higher and a lot steeper than it looked from the air. We felt every step on the way up. You know, that's a lot like reading the Bible. We read about the lives of the heroes of faith from 30,000 feet. We read summaries of their humble beginnings, and then we fast forward to their glorious finishes, and it can be very easy to forget that they traveled a long and a winding road in between. Abraham walked in circles for 25 years, waiting for the promises of God. Jacob toiled in crooked Uncle Laban's pastures for 20 years, his pay was cut 10 times. It took Joseph 13 years to get from the pit to the palace. David waited 20 years to become the next king of Israel. For eight of those years, he ran for his life from the first king of Israel. Paul sewed tents for 13 years after his call on the Damascus road before one day Barnabas knocked on his door in Tarsus. Caleb, I think, is a record holder. Forty-five years, he walked through the wilderness waiting to claim his mountain. And as I look at his story, I see a few keys for claiming your mountain, and I want to share them with you this morning. Some keys for claiming your mountain. The first one is this. Hold on to your vision. Vision is what you're going to become. Vision is what you're going to do. Vision is what you're going to build with your life. Vision is the quality of your life that you're going to achieve for yourself, for others. Vision is the ministry that you're going to do. Where does vision come from? Vision comes from the glimpses that God has given you over your life. Vision comes from the places where you've walked once. It comes from what you've touched. It comes from what you have seen with your eyes. It comes from what you have tasted. Caleb walked all over a mountain. He saw it with his eyes. He touched it. He tasted its fruit. And what he experienced on the mountain left a vision in his heart that was so vivid that it didn't fade even after 45 years of hard walking in the wilderness. You know, phase two is a vision that was born in my heart, not just 16 years ago in 1998, but more than 30 years ago in the early 80s. In junior high school, I used to sit and I used to doodle in my notebook. And I would draw the floor plans of a big church sanctuary. I would doodle the facades of church buildings. And I would dream about building a great church someday. I dreamed of building a physical edifice that would make a statement itself about the greatness, the worthiness of our God who is creative and unique and inspiring and excellent and always deserving of our very best efforts. And I dreamed of the kind of church family that would occupy that remarkable building. I dreamed of a spirit-filled family. I dreamed of worship services overflowing with the beautiful presence of God. You see, my family started out in a church that met in a splendid building. It was historic. It was ornate. It was excellent. But the Holy Spirit wasn't there. And then someone introduced us to a little church that, in spite of all their best efforts, was always messy and chaotic. They were overrun with people. And they couldn't keep up. The facility was overwhelmed. The volunteers were overwhelmed. The parking lots were overwhelmed. In fact, the only intersection in the sleepy little town was overwhelmed. So the police had to direct traffic night after night after night because the church was meeting seven days a week because of the revival that was going on there. See, the reason it was like that was because the Holy Spirit was there. His presence was so beautiful that people just kept coming and coming and coming, and they couldn't stop them. I remember walking into that little church for the very first time. The worship had already started. And when I heard the sound of the worship, I said to myself, this must be what heaven sounds like because it is so joyful. 
You know, that's still my dream. A church where people walk in and they say, this must be what heaven sounds like. This must be what heaven feels like. The look on their faces, it must be what heaven looks like. I also dreamed of a faith-filled family. If I were to use one word to describe the church experience of my youth, it would have to be anticipation. We literally came every week expecting that people would be healed, expecting that people would be filled with the Holy Spirit and radically transformed, and they were. We came expecting to hear testimonies of answered prayer, and we did. We came expecting the Holy Spirit to move in prophetic gifts and word of knowledge and to speak in the midst of the sanctuary, and he did. You know, that's one reason why we need phase two. It's not just something we want. It's something we need in order to fulfill the vision. Because doing back-to-back services on Saturday night with our Spanish congregation, doing three services in a row on Sunday morning, we don't have time to do what's most important. And that's to open the altars and let the Holy Spirit touch people. Now listen, don't get worried. Our Sunday morning services in phase two probably won't be any longer than they are now. So if you have ants in your pants, you can go. (laughs) But if you've just been downsized, if there's a crisis in your family, if you've just received bad results back from the lab, maybe you would appreciate the opportunity to come to the altar and let God do what only God can do. I dreamed of a loving family. And the church experience of my youth, there wasn't competition in the atmosphere. People didn't vie for this spotlight. There wasn't self-promotion. There wasn't jealousy. There wasn't strife. There wasn't division in the atmosphere. Genuine affection was in the atmosphere. Kindness was in the atmosphere. Practical helpfulness was in the atmosphere. Generosity was in the atmosphere. We had people struggling under the bad economy of the 70s. Maybe you remember it. We had people struggling to rebuild their lives since coming to Christ. And they were embraced and they were supported in every way possible by the family of God. Can I tell you that such an atmosphere is exclusively the work of the Holy Spirit? You cannot wish it, you cannot will it, you cannot work for it, you can't create it, only the Holy Spirit can create it. In the church of my youth, people didn't want to go home, and they didn't. You know, that's another reason why we need phase two. Because harvest time is meant to be that kind of a loving place. It's destined to be that kind of a loving place. But right now, we don't have the physical space to express it. I know it's kind of counterintuitive, but a bigger building will actually help us to become a closer-knit church family. Imagine what it'll be like to have lobbies and lounges and meeting rooms and corridors that can actually accommodate our church family. People sometimes say to me, Pastor Glenn, you know, this has been such a, such a struggle to get to groundbreaking on phase two. It's such a, a massive project. Why not just, you know, add a little bit to this building somewhere and call it a day? Well, first of all, under the new zoning laws, that's not an option. It's phase two or nothing. But more importantly, our family is already big enough to fill phase two entirely. So a little more space won't do the trick. Actually, I have to tell you the truth. It's going to get a little worse before it gets better. We're going to lose some space before we're able to create more space. The dome is going to be coming down in just a couple of weeks to make way for phase two. We're going to be playing musical classrooms for a while. The staff is going to be playing musical offices for a while. We're going to lose our main entrance on this level for a while. We're going to lose the prayer room for a while. The lower level lobby is going to have to become a classroom for a while. So we're going to need everyone to be patient for a while and stay loose and stay flexible while we work towards our goal. I also dreamed of a fruitful family. In the church experience of my youth, every week people came to the Lord. We baptized about 30 to 50 people a month for 20 years. 
People from all walks of life experience radical life transformations. And that's my dream for Harvest Time Church. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. That's why nothing short of phase two would do. Where does vision come from? It comes from the glimpses God has given you. It comes from the places that you've walked. It comes from what you've seen, what you've touched, what you've tasted. How do I know that the kind of church that I dream about is possible? Because I've already been there. Because I've seen it with my own eyes. I've touched it. I've tasted it. I have been to the mountain. I have seen the other side. I know it exists. And I know that it is my inheritance. See, I'm not just reminiscing. I'm not just romanticizing the past. I'm not taking a trip down memory lane. I'm not trying to bore you by telling you about where I've been. I'm trying to excite you by telling you about where we're going. I'm on a journey to claim my inheritance in God. I have a vision. I will not let it go. I want that mountain. Let me relate two other experiences with you. If you haven't already figured out, I'm weird. And after I share these, I'm going to be even weirder to you. But let me tell you. One is the night that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit on my bed. As a kid, I began worshiping the Lord. And the presence of God came down into my bedroom. And it pushed down on me like a heavy weight. It wasn't frightening, it wasn't uncomfortable, it was glorious. In fact, it was so beautiful that I didn't want to move because I was afraid if I moved, it would go away, and I didn't want it to go away. And I began worshiping God in a heavenly language. I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what was happening to me until my mom explained to me the next morning what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Along the way, one of my fathers and the Lord told me, you know, Glenn, that night it was a very special spiritual experience that you might never have again. Not the tongues, but the glory part. And I believed him. And I thank God for the encounter, but I didn't really ever expect to experience it again until Mother's Day when the Greenwich outpouring began. And for the first time in 30 years, I experienced the same weight of God's presence pushing down on me. And I've experienced several times since. And in that moment, I came to understand that the glory of God was not merely a one-off experience, but it is my inheritance. It's not meant to be just an experience of my past, but a destination of my future. The other experience was in seventh grade. We did a project in social studies where we were given a state to study. We had to do a report on the history and the geography and the demographics and the economy of the state. And I was given the state of Connecticut. And I remember studying the map of Connecticut, the coastline of Connecticut. And I remember finding a little inlet close to New York City on the coast and saying, I want to live right there someday. Honestly, I have to tell you the truth, I forgot all about that. When God called us to Greenwich in 1996, we were open to going anywhere in the world, north, south, east, or west. I didn't even remember that seventh grade project till after we moved here. And walking at Todd's Point in Greenwich one morning, the Lord reminded me, You might believe that's a coincidence if you want to, but I know that it was God pointing me to my inheritance. You know, those kinds of coincidences have followed me my whole life, like when Central Bible College mailed my wife's diploma to the church where I was working a year before we met. (laughs) The glory of God in my bedroom wasn't just a one-time experience. It is my inheritance. Connecticut is not just a coincidence. Denise is not just a coincidence. It is my inheritance. I want that mountain. Where does your vision come from? 
It comes from the experiences and the coincidences of your life. It comes from the glimpses of glory that God has given you. It comes from what God has allowed you to see and taste and to touch. It comes from the connections God has made for you. Where have you been? What have you seen? What have you touched? What have you tasted? What visitations of the Holy Spirit have you had? How has God used you? you in special moments in your life? What men and women of the Spirit have you had the privilege of being exposed to? I want to tell you those experiences and those coincidences, they are your inheritance. Is there a yearning in your heart to see something you saw once? Is there a longing to taste and touch what you have tasted and touched before? Is there a desire in your heart? It is not dwelling in the past. It is a vision for your inheritance. Hold on to your vision. Because vision is powerful. Vision keeps you on course. The Bible says where there is no vision, where there is no revelation from God, the people literally, what it says, cast off restraint. If you have no vision for your life, you wander aimlessly, you live recklessly. But vision puts guardrails on your path. Vision makes you live intentionally. Vision makes you act deliberately. Vision makes you choose wisely. Caleb said for 45 years, while Israel was wandering around in the desert, I was following God. The name Caleb means faithful companion. He is the epitome. The theme of the book of Joshua is that God rewards faithfulness. And Caleb is the number one example. He is the epitome of faithfulness in this book. He was the first person to receive his inheritance in the promised land. And what kept Caleb faithful was his vision. He saw what others did not see. You know, ten times in the wilderness, the children of Israel rebelled against Moses and the Lord. But Caleb stayed on course. See, that's what vision will do for you. Vision will keep you on course when Korah and Dathan and Abiram are leading a rebellion against God's servants. Vision will keep you on course when fiery serpents enter the camp and begin killing people with the poison of gossip and complaining. Vision will keep you on course while others bow to the idols of American culture. Vision will keep you on course when others are overcome by fear. Vision will keep you on course when others are hung up on the cafeteria food. Vision will keep you on course when others settle for less than their inheritance east of the Jordan. Vision says, I am not going to listen to this. I'm not going to get sucked into this. I'm not going to get distracted by this. I'm not going to get taken out for this. Ain't nobody got time for that. I've been to the mountain. I've seen the other side. I know what's waiting for me. I know it exists. I've seen it. I've tasted it. I've touched it. I don't have time for this nonsense. I want my mountain. Vision causes you to stand out like a star in your generation. God said, this is powerful. This is powerful talk in the Bible. God said, I hated that entire generation. God's anger burned against them. He was displeased with them. He scattered their bodies in the desert. Only Caleb and Joshua survived. Of Caleb, God said, he is a different spirit than all the rest. He's followed me with his whole heart. Therefore, the places that his feet have touched will become his inheritance. Listen, not everyone that you're traveling with today will reach his inheritance, but that will not prevent you from reaching yours. Some, many, will die in the desert. Many will fall by the way. Many will disqualify themselves. Many will take themselves out, but not you. Paul said, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you might become blameless, pure children of God without fault amidst a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars. Vision will keep you alive. 
Vision will keep you young. Vision will keep you invigorated. Vision will keep you sharp and in shape. Vision will keep you engaged and focused. I like what Caleb says. I'm 85 years old and I'm still ready to rumble. I'm still strong. I'm still got a little fight left in me. I'm still just as determined as I ever was. Two of my greatest heroes are my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. The most recent ministry assignment that they just finished was running a huge food bank at their church in the city of Toronto. And in that food bank ministry, they led many, many hundreds of people to the Lord, including many Muslims and many Hindus. Now at the age of 79, my father-in-law is earnestly praying for his next ministry assignment and he feels like God wants to use him in the ministry of healing. You see, that's his inheritance. That's where he walked. He was born with deformed feet. And they took him to the Pentecostal church. And they laid hands and prayed on him. And in front of the 40 people that were there, God instantly healed his feet in front of their eyes. He's touched healing. He's tasted healing. It's not just an experience of his past. It's his inheritance. And at an age, at 79 years old, when most people are hanging up their shoes, my father-in-law is on his face saying, God, show me what's next. That's what vision will do for for you. Vision builds your faith for the victories that are ahead. You know, one of the surprising things I've learned along the way about the life of faith is that the challenges keep getting bigger and bigger. And they didn't tell me, pastor, they didn't, in Bible school, they didn't tell me. I think they didn't tell me on purpose. I think they fooled all of us because if they told us, we would have quit. I don't know where I got this idea, but when I was younger, I got this notion in my head. Succeed when you're young, and then you can just enjoy the ride and relax for the rest of your life. I have found out that life is not like that. And the life of faith is certainly not like that. After you kill the lion and the bear, there's a giant to defeat. After Goliath, there's a King Saul to contend with. After Saul, there are Philistines to conquer. After the Philistines, there is an Absalom to outlast. After traversing the wilderness, there's a Jordan to cross. After Jordan, there's a Jericho. After Jericho, there's big trouble at a little place called Ai. After Ai, there are giants to drive out of the land. After acquiring the land, there's phase one to build. After building phase one, there's phase two. After phase two, there is a mission in the world that God has uniquely for this church that we have not yet touched, but we shall because I want that mountain. And listen, at the human level, the risk is very real. Only God knows how it's all going to play out. We don't have any idea. There is imminent danger of failure. There is imminent danger of injury. There is imminent danger of loss. But there's a moment where your faith manifests in raw courage and you say, heaven help me, I'm going in. I like Caleb's words. Give me my mountain. There are steep hills. There are giants. There are large fortified cities. But maybe God will help me. Mountains and giants and walls. Oh, my. You know, those were precisely the three deterrents that the ten spies used to dissuade the whole congregation of Israel not to take the land 40 years earlier. Only Caleb and Joshua said, no, we have to go for it now. What's amazing, after 45 years of doing laps in the wilderness, Caleb's heart hadn't changed. Heaven help me, I'm going in. Maybe God will help me. You know, that's not just rhetoric. That's a real life moment in a man's life when the rubber hits the road. It's Jonathan and his armor bearer climbing up the cliff with their bare hands, just one sword between the two of them to take on a whole army. Maybe God will help us. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego staring in the mouth of the fiery furnace. We're going in. We know God can. We believe he will. But no matter what, we're going to praise him. It's Esther knocking on the door of the king's chamber. 
I'm going in. Heaven help me. If I live, I live. If I die, I die. But I'm going in. I don't know what's going to happen, but I want that mountain. And heaven help me. I'm going in. You know, when you have a vision, your faith grows day by day with each passing trial. For 45 years, while the children of Israel wandered, Caleb saw the wonders of God every day. Every morning when he tasted the manna, the bread from heaven, everyone else was complaining about the cafeteria food. But when he tasted the manna, he tasted a God who is bigger than mountains and giants and walls. When he took a swig of the water that ran from the rock in the desert. You know, the book of Hebrews says that the rock followed them everywhere they went. I want to know when I get to heaven, I got to see the video reel how that worked. (laughs) Every day when he took a swig of that water, he tasted a God who is bigger than mountains and giants and walls. When he saw the ground open up and swallow Kura and Dathan and Abiram, he witnessed the power of a God who is bigger than mountains and giants and walls. When he saw the bronze serpent lifted up in the wilderness and everyone who looked up at it and repented at the ugliness of his sin and rebellion, he saw the healing power of a God who is bigger than mountains and giants and walls. And when he crossed over the Jordan River on dry ground and he saw the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, he saw a God who was just as potent as he had been 45 years ago. Beloved, listen to me and be encouraged. God has not changed his mind, nor has he lost any of his strength while he's been waiting for you to get yourself together and go get your mountain. Why has God allowed trials in your life? Why has he allowed you to take some laps in the desert? Why has he let you witness some things you wished you had never seen? Why have things been getting incrementally more difficult rather than easier? It's not to destroy you. It's not to dishearten you. It's not to break you. It is to build your faith day by day so that by clinging to vision while others are wandering aimlessly through life, you are seeing in your circumstances the wonders of God unfold. You know, that's precisely why God sent Elijah to Zarephath. Elijah wasn't ready for a showdown at Mount Carmel until he watched a Gentile widow exercise her faith day after day. See, there never was more than one cup of flour in that sack. There never was more than one drop of oil in her jar for three years. But every day she offered the last of what she had to the man of God first. And then there was enough to feed her family and enough left over for the next day. And seeing her exercise her faith day after day after day brought Elijah to the place where he was convinced that he was serving a God who can do anything. Listen to me, as you cling to your vision day by day, your faith is getting stronger. Day by day, you are growing in your spirit. Day by day, you are growing in anticipation. Hold on to your vision. Cling to your vision. Never, ever let it go. Though the earth be shaken, though the mountains be removed and cast into the sea, though a thousand fall at your right side and 10,000 on your left, guard your vision. Be guided by your vision. Write down the vision and make it plain so that others can read it and run with it. Though your vision tarries, it will come quickly when it comes. It will speak of your end and it will not prove false. Keys for claiming your mountain. That was only point one and our time is up. Let me give you the next two super fast. Jesus, help us. I'm going away, so I have... I have three weeks to recover. You have three weeks to recover. All right, number two. Hold on to your vision, number two. I'm going to go fast. Hold on to God's word. Hold on to God's word. Paul wrote to Timothy, follow the prophecies that were made in advance about you and use them to wage good warfare. Cling to the promises of God. Cling to the word of God. Cling to the prophetic words that were spoken about you ahead of time. Pray into them. 
Sow into them. Plan according to them. Go to war with them. Caleb held on to God's promises, both general promises and specific promises, and he used them to wage war against giants. See, as a son of Abraham, there was a promise resting over his life. Your children shall possess the gates of their enemies. You know, you're a son of Abraham. You're a child of Abraham. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And if you have been connected to Christ by faith, then you are also a son of Abraham, which means that every promise is germane to you. You shall possess the gates of your enemies. God will contend with those who contend with you, and he will save your children. You shall be like a tree planted by the streams of living water. Your leaf will never fade or wither. You'll bring forth good fruit in season. And everything you touch shall prosper. As a son of Israel, there was a promise of success given through Moses. That Israel would defeat the Anakim, the giants. And then there was a specific promise that God had made to him regarding his inheritance. I swear to you, God said, I will give you that mountain where you walked. You know, as we get ready to break ground on phase two, there are three promises that I'm holding on to. The first is that I'm called to the ministry. The second is that I'm called to Pastor Harvest Time Church. And the third is that I'm called specifically to build this building. God made me a promise in the book of Joshua. In January of 1999, before we closed on this land, before we built phase one, before we put up an air dome, before we launched a Spanish church, and before we launched a Stanford campus, before we did anything we did, God made me a promise. Be strong and very courageous because you will lead the people into the land I promised to them and into their inheritance. When God made me that promise, it was for phase one and phase two. Didn't know then that it was going to be a 20-year trip. But I still believe his promise. I want that mountain. What has God promised you? What promises, both general and specific, can you cling to? What good words of God can you use? What specific prophecies have been pronounced over you? Remember them and use them to wage a good war on the enemy. Rehearse God's word. Pray his word back to him. Declare his words in the atmosphere. Announce those words to men. You know what I go around telling people? I go around telling people I'm going to build the biggest auditorium in Greenwich, Connecticut. I don't tell them I don't have a dime. They don't need to know that. I just tell them what God has promised me. There's a man named Eliezer, one of David's mighty men of valor. And he fought the enemy all day clinging to the sword. From early in the morning to late at night, he drove back the enemy, clinging, 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 clinging to the sword. And when the, the battle was over, the sword was clinging to him. They couldn't get it out of his hand. His hand was frozen. His, his flesh was melded to the sword. They couldn't pry the sword out of his hand. You know, the sword is the word of God. We use it to wage warfare. And as we cling to the promises of God, the promises of God cling to us. So they're just stuck to us. I am stuck full of promise. You can't get promise off me. You can't take promise out of my hand. It is fused with me. It is because become part of me and I a part of it. Keys to claiming your mountain. Hold on to your vision. Hold on to God's word. Worship team, hurry. <laughs> and the last thing, hold on to hope for the next generation. We have to, we have to take, I have to finish my sermon. <laughs> we have to pray. We have to take communion. We have to take an offering for Pastor Bobby on the way out and we have 10 minutes to do it. All right. <laughs> So if you believe in miracles, you better start praying. Here's the last key. Hold on to hope for the next generation. Everybody look at me, if you would, because this is important. It is not selfish to pursue your inheritance in Christ. 
It's not selfish for you to pursue your inheritance. Paul said, I press forward, I push forward to take hold of that thing for which Christ took a hold of me. It's not selfish for you to pursue your inheritance because when you pursue your inheritance, you help others achieve theirs. See, that's the way it works in the kingdom of God. That's the way it works in God's economy. Everyone wins. Everyone comes into his own. Everyone comes up to another level. Caleb was the first person to receive his inheritance in the land, and he was the key to everyone else receiving theirs. The giants had to be cleared out of the south land before the rest of Israel could go settle in their land. There's a summary statement to Caleb's life. After he took the giants, it says, then the land had rest from war. You see, claiming your mountain is never about just you. It's about everything that God wants to do through you to bless others. Phase two, and the spirit-filled, faith-filled, loving, fruitful family that is going to fill that building is my mountain. It is my inheritance. But as I claim what's mine, you'll get what's yours. And as you claim what's yours, others will get what's theirs. I'm struck by Caleb reaching out in Joshua 15 for help from his younger brother, Othniel. Personally, I think that Caleb was well able to finish the job himself. But he was intentional about engaging the younger generation in the battle. He was intentional about tapping into their strength. Caleb did it so that long after he was gone, the DNA of victory would be with that next generation. The taste of victory, the thrill of victory. He did it so that their faith would grow. He did it so they would know what it feels like to be God's partners in a supernatural war. Othniel went on in the book of Judges to become the very first judge of Israel. And it says he was full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Caleb put his arm around the next generation and he said, Come on, let's go take some giants down together. The three giants, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, they were precisely the same giants that were in the mountain 45 years ago earlier. Apparently, Iris giants, giants not only have long arms and long legs, they have long lives as well. You know, that's the thing about giants. If you fail to kill giants today, they will not magically disappear tomorrow. You can't get rid of your giants by pretending they don't exist. Deal with your issues. Deal with your junk. Deal with your problems. Deal with the things that are standing in your way of achieving fullness in Christ. Kill them now or kill them later, but kill giants you must if you want your mountain. Caleb's generation failed to kill the giants. So Caleb grabbed the next generation. And he said, let's finish this together. Beloved, can I tell you, there are some giants in the American church. I'm talking about the church with a capital C, and it applies to ours too. There are some giants in the American church that our generation has failed to kill. Giant of rebellion. Giant of stubbornness. A giant of idolatry. A giant of impurity, of indifference, giant of grumbling and gossiping. But I have hope in God for the next generation that God will use their partnership, that God will use their strength to accomplish what the last generation did not. I'm going to close with this for real. Guys who are serving communion, get ready because we're going to move fast. We're going to take communion in record time. Almost a year ago, I had a dream about phase two. 
it was on a Sunday morning, the one that I preached about heaven last August. That was a good sermon. If you never heard a good sermon on August, go to our archives and listen about heaven. You'll speak in tongues. But in the dream, a builder was showing me all over phase two, the lower level, the upper level of phase two. He was leading me from room to room. And everywhere they were putting the finishing touches on the building. They were laying carpet, they were laying tiles, they were painting the walls. Walked into the fellowship hall. We have a, an area for fellowship on the lower level of the new building that's bigger than this entire sanctuary. And in my dream, we walked in and there was a bulletin board on the wall in the wrong place. And I said, get that, that's in the wrong, get that. See, even in my dreams, I'm a pain in the neck. And I just kept walking all over the building saying, I can't believe it's done. I can't believe it's finished so soon. I can't believe it's here already. And I literally awoke out of that dream shouting for joy. Afterwards, the Lord spoke several distinct things to me. One of them was this. The generation that crossed the Jordan was different than the generation that crossed the Red Sea. See, in the American church, God is going to replace a generation of complainers with a generation of giant killers. He's going to replace a generation of doubters with a generation of doers. He's going to replace a generation that would not with a generation that will. So let's embrace the next generation at Harvest Time Church. Let's be intentional about engaging them. Let's tap into their strength and let's partner with them to kill giants and to take mountains. How do you claim your mountain? Hold on to your vision. Hold on to God's word. Hold on to hope for the next generation. I want my mountain. Phase two is my inheritance. A spirit-filled, faith-filled, fruitful, loving family is my inheritance. The atmosphere of heaven, the glory of God, healing ministry, revival is my inheritance. I want my mountain. And I want you to have yours. Stand on your feet and let's give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, let's do it. Would you lift him up? Let's give him a great big praise.